Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, leading publishers of books, directories, educational guides and magazines aimed at schools in the UK and beyond. Enjoy the podcast. Hi, welcome to The Late Show with Daisy and Elizabeth. My name is Daisy Christodoulou and I'm here with Elizabeth Wells. Elizabeth is the School Archivist at Westminster School in London and a specialist in the history of education. I'm the Director of Education at No More Marking. We're a provider of online writing assessments and as a result of that I spend a lot of my time thinking about the future of education and at the moment in particular thinking about whether it is possible for artificial intelligence to mark essays and sometimes it's good to get a different perspective on education. And by thinking about education in the past, it can help us make sense of it in the present and the future. And that's what we want to try and do in this podcast. The topic we want to focus on today is English public schools. They've been in the news a bit lately. And as we're going to discover in this podcast, that's not that unusual. They're a perennial topic of attention and probably also controversy in England. Uh, Recently, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has pledged to abolish the VAT exemption that's enjoyed by fee-paying schools. Our current Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, went to Winchester, which is one of the oldest independent schools in the country. And of course, Boris Johnson and David Cameron, two more recent Prime Ministers, both went to Eton. And I think you also have further controversy where some people would attribute some of the failings of the British state to the fact that so many people at the top of it attended some of these schools. And there is a campaign called Abolish Eton, which seeks to do just that. So first of all, I think it would be good to define our terms. The topic of today's show is English public schools, but if you've been listening closely, I've already used the terms independent schools, fee-paying schools, you hear the term private school used a lot too, and all those terms mean slightly different things, and I think that's one of the sources of confusion about these schools. So Americans often get confused by this. What the Americans call a public school is what we would call a state school. What we would call what we call a public school in, in England is what most countries would probably call a private school. But confusingly, we do also use the term private school. So, Lizzie, first of all, can you explain to us exactly what a public school is and where the term comes from? So we start seeing the term public school used from the 18th century. Um, we have a plan in Westminster School in our archive which shows the school's buildings and it labels the schoolroom as the public school. And towards uh, the end of the 18th century, William Vincent, who's the headmaster, uh, uses the term in a pamphlet, which he writes in defence of public education. It's a response to um, a cleric who's master at Temple, who's accused these schools of failing in their moral education. And Vincent comes in strong on the defence of the public schools. But the reason it starts to become more popular in the 18th century is really that it's being used to define these schools against another type of school that's really growing in popularity during that period. And those are the private schools. So these are schools that are established generally by a single individual. They're being run for profit and they're often catering for only a a small handful of, of children. Although we're used to thinking of the term public as meaning state run and often as a consequence free, um, as in public schools in America or even in Scotland, closer to home. Public's being used in a different way here. It's better to think more of, say, a public house, um, you know, a pub or a bar in the UK, or a public swimming pool, in the sense that it's a facility which is uh, communal and theoretically open to all, but you are still expected to pay. Um, You're not just going to wander in and get a load of free pints. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think that that comparison with a public house that is interesting. So it's not something you do have to pay for it, but it but it's communal. Um, so that that kind of I guess makes sense. So then, what are, what are the characteristics? Like, what's the difference? You've got these public schools that are in existence at this time. You've got private schools where people are, 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 are paying a fee, but they're running sort of private houses. So what's the, the kind of difference between these public schools and private schools? What's the what's the like characteristics of the public schools at this time? It's very difficult to come up with um, a a sort of fixed definition, but you can certainly think about a cluster of characteristics which distinguish these schools. One is that they tend to be endowed, that is, that they've been set up with finance behind them. They're independent of state control. They're nearly always fee-paying, but they're not privately owned or being run for a profit, and therefore they often end up being charitable foundations. And then there's 
two other characteristics which sort of go hand in hand. One is that they generally have some kind of capacity for boarding, though not necessarily all of their pupils will be boarders. And because of that, it means that they're drawing pupils from across the country. So they're not necessarily just local schools. And that becomes really critical when we think of them in terms of sort of gathering the elite of the country in a single space. So that point about the charitable foundation is is really interesting because, again, that's something in the news at the moment that essentially a lot of these schools have charitable status that entitles them to a VAT exemption. And, and that is a source, as I say, at the moment of, of political controversy. So that's clearly, clearly kind of relevant today. So, so which schools are public schools? We've talked about them a lot, but we've, we've given a, you know, a few examples early on. But give us some examples. Which schools are public schools? Which schools are not public schools? So there's always a lot of debate about this. In the 1860s, there was a major government inquiry specifically setting out to look at public schools, and it was called the Clarendon Commission. But what's interesting is that there was a fair bit of jockeying as to who would be included in this government inquiry. So some schools were pretty suspicious and wanted to avoid it and managed to do so. So Christ Hospital School sort of managed to avoid um, inclusion. But others really wanted to be included because they saw it as a mark of status. So the headmaster of Shrewsbury School really lobbied and tried to get in and so was included in the investigation. So it's a little bit arbitrary who the Clarendon Commission pick. But in the end, they look at nine schools and as a a result of their investigation, they pass some legislation in 1868, which is known as the Public Schools Act. And of the nine investigated, seven schools are included in that legislation. So those are Eton, Winchester, Westminster, Harrow, Rugby, Charterhouse and Shrewsbury. And as a consequence, these are often thought of as being the great public schools or or the major public schools. But (laughs) in the 19th century, there's a massive flourishing of these sort of schools schools that are fulfilling the characteristics that we've discussed. You've got a growing middle class, you've got increasing professionalisation of key occupations, and then you've got railways and improved communications. And all of this support um, this proliferation of boarding schools up and down the country. And so generally the definition we now use for a public school is whether they're a membership of an organisation called HMC, which is now, as of 2023, rebranded as Heads Conference, but when it was founded in 1869, was called Headmasters Conference. Now, initially, the Headmasters Conference didn't include any of those seven schools that I've just listed that were mentioned in the Public Schools Act. Um, But over the course of the 19th and 20th century, it expanded and it now represents uh, over 300 schools. And those include, um, from the 1990s, girls' schools. And so initially it was renamed the Headmasters and the Headmistresses Conference. So so this point about the sort of different gradations between these schools is really interesting, because I think you can come to to this as an outsider and you sort of, you know, I I certainly sort of growing up would think, you you know, you see these big boarding schools with the the big houses rolling, rolling kind of fields in the countryside. And you just sort of assume they're all they're all public schools. But actually, there's this distinction, I guess, between what you're saying, the great public schools, which are these seven that get included in this piece of legislation, and then all these other schools. And I think there is a, an element of kind of snobbery w- w- within this, isn't there? And, and the term, you get this term minor public school, which was in the news just recently. So Prince Harry recently you know, did an interview on ITV with Tom Bradby, and Tom Bradby went to Sherbourne School. And someone wrote up in the Telegraph, they wrote a review of it, and they said Tom Bradby was dressed in classic minor public school style. And and, and, uh, and an enraged correspondent with the Telegraph wrote in and said, Sherbourne is not a minor public school. And this, I think, sparked sparked even more letters to to, to the Telegraph page. And so from what you're saying, Sherbourne's not part of this act. (laughs) So in its, I suppose, strictly technical sense, we're going to say if you're not part of this act, you you know, you're you're not one of that seven if you're outside that, 
does that mean you're this minor public school or is minor public school really just kind of a, a bit a bit of a snobbish term that that, that that people in other schools use to look down on on some of them yeah i think it's definitely yeah. a derogatory term right. and i'm not sure there are many schools out there that would willingly admit <laughs> that they are a minor public school but this <coughs> snobbery um it's it's gone on through the ages yeah. you know you and i we're both big fans of um dorothy l sayers yeah. Um, and her fictional detective, Lord Peter Whimsey. And there's this lovely bit in her novel, Murder Must Advertise, where Whimsey is asked which schools he classes as public schools. And he responds, Eton, promptly, and Harrow, (laughs) he added magnanimously, (laughs) for he was an Eton man. And then someone suggests rugby. No, no, that's a railway junction. And then he pauses and considers and says, there's a decentish sort of place at Winchester, if you're not too particular. OK, um, <laughs> so I'm going to see you, you're, uh, you're Peter Whimsey. I'm going to raise you, Evelyn Moore. <laughs> so this is from Evelyn Moore, Decline and Fall. And uh, this is where Paul Pennyfeather, he's been sent down for being a naughty boy at uh, Oxford and he has to become a tutor and he goes to an agency and he says, what school have you got to me? Where could I go and work? And the head of the agency says, well, he says, we class schools, you see, into four grades. Leading school, first rate school, good school and school. Frankly, school is pretty bad. <laughs> and I've often thought if, if Ofsted wanted to do a reform, that they've currently got their four gradations of school. They, they could they could rename them. They could take some tips from, from Evelyn Moore. But um, <laughs> I think all of this kind of thing, this is maybe the, the, the kind of thing that people, you know, fr- from outside look at this and go, this is all just ridiculous. This is one of the problems with Britain that people uh, kind of you know, make these jokes and all this snobbery within this uh, kind of very tiny uh, kind of e- elite section of, of, of British society. But actually, if we go back to the beginnings, the very origins, we've been talking about the 18th and 19th century, but a lot of these schools kind of predate that. And, and it kind of gets interesting here because we view these schools as this kind of epitome now, I think, of maybe of wealth and privilege and snobbery. But if we go back in time, it gets a bit more interesting. So let's do that now. Let's go back in time and think about how did these schools start? Where, where do they begin, most of them? And then we can think a bit about the types of, 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 of students who attended them. So, so, yeah, how does that work? Although there are a number of grammar schools attached to cathedrals and other ecclesiastical foundations in the medieval period, Winchester is really the first public school that's established. It's founded by William Wickham in 1382, and Wickham is the Bishop of Winchester, but he's also Chancellor to two kings. So he's Edward III's Chancellor and then Richard II's Chancellor. So he's a leading statesman. And he's responding to a particular problem. He's struggling to get a good supply of properly educated clerics. And this is a period where the clergy, like Wickham, are really vital as administrators within the government machinery. So he decides to found two educational bodies to help plug that gap. Um, He starts with New College um, in Oxford, um, and then he follows with Winchester College. And so he endows these foundations, he arranges for, for buildings to be constructed for them, and he sets out that there's going to be 70 scholars in each institution. Um, And those scholars are supposedly meant to be poor boys. 50 years later, we have Henry VI, and he founds Eton College and King's College, Cambridge. And along very similar lines, he's following this model that's been set out. Um, And he even has the same number of scholars, 70 scholars. Though in a typical Etonian fashion, he can't resist a little bit of one-upmanship. He sets out that he wants Eton to be the best grammar school and to be called the lady, mother and mistress of all other grammar schools. Um, And then Westminster, which I think fits um, really into a a neat category with these these other two schools, is set up in 1540 by Henry VIII, Um, but it's a slightly more modest scale, so there's only going to be 40 scholars, and it's also linked to two Oxbridge colleges. In this case, we've got Christchurch, Oxford, and then Trinity College, Cambridge. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. So... That's also really fascinating. I think fascinating. We we talk about these schools now as 
kind of maybe dominating maybe the upper you know, their, their alumni dominate the upper reaches of the British state but I guess in some ways when you look at the origins of them in some ways they were they were devised to do that in, in lots of ways so as I say we, we view these schools now as as places that obviously have quite expensive fees and, and yes they will take in you know some 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 people's on scholarships but they generally have you know that reputation of wealth and, and privilege and, and, and prestige but re- really interesting what you said there that they're originally founded in the case of Eton and Winchester and some of the others for for poor scholars they're founded for commoners. They're founded for people who are not that wealthy. And I remember when I first found this out, I, I thought I'd, I misunderstood it somehow. It just feels so at odds with what we know about these schools now. So when you're saying they're founded for commoners, they're founded for, for poor boys, and I mean, it is all boys that we're talking about here. Uh, it's, it's, all, it's all men. Um, what, what exactly does that mean? Like, is there, how, do they, how are they defining poor boys? How are they defining commoners? Is it something where these are genuinely really commoners? Or is it actually it's just the younger sons of minor aristocracy who don't have very much money. What exactly are we talking about? Are there means tests? Like, like how, do, how are they defining that in this era? It's a little bit different for each of those three schools. But yes, there's certainly a narrative that you can draw where they're founded for poor scholars, hijacked by the elite, and this perverts the founders' original intentions. Now, you might accuse me of being an apologist for the public schools, but I would qualify this a little bit because these schools were never really intended as engines of social mobility. That's quite an alien notion to the people who are founding them. And although there are certain stipulations on wealth and background for the pupils, we find these get ignored pretty swiftly. So at Winchester, Wickham gives himself and his own relations the right to nominate boys for the scholarships. And that becomes something that's really sought after as the school um, becomes successful. And originally, there is a test to see if the boys can sing, because there's a sense of them also being choristers and, and taking part in religious services. But that very quickly becomes a rubber stamp with the boys simply reading the first line of a psalm as part of their admissions process. And then at Westminster, they do specify that the boys should not have a father who had independent property of more than £10 a year. And £10 a year in the sort of mid part of the 16th century, that's about a year's wages for a skilled tradesperson. Um, but it's independent property, so it's not saying that your father should, shouldn't be earning more than £10 a year, it's that he shouldn't have property worth more than £10 a year. Um, so these aren't the most um, humble of backgrounds. And even with that acknowledged the statutes themselves are never actually confirmed by the monarch so it's not official policy and indeed there's another requirement it's a geographic requirement so they say that at the point that they select the scholars they shouldn't have more than one from a particular county again they're seeing these schools as national schools uh, stretching their reach right across the country but that pretty swiftly becomes unworkable So that's disregarded too. Unlike Eton and Winchester, though, Westminster does maintain a competitive scholarship exam. So that's rather interesting. It's called the Challenge and it's an oral examination and it takes place over several weeks. Um, So at the end of the main lessons each day, you stand up and you question an adversary until they make a mistake. And then you swap places um, and that person questions you. And that helps them uh, form a ranking and they select the best boys uh, to become scholars. But the issue with this system is that you have to really be part of the school before you can become a scholar. So that sets a little bit of a threshold there for entry. I have to interrupt you, Lizzie. Obviously, I work in educational assessment. This sounds like so unstandardised, you know, so, uh, (laughs) so many, so many, so many rooms, so much room for things to go wrong. Also, it's rife with corruption. So if you're wealthy and want to become a scholar at Westminster, you might pay a pupil who's already a scholar to help tutor you and be your aid in the challenge. But one of the interesting things about Westminster is because the scholarship is academically selective, it continues to have a prestige, which isn't the case at Winchester and Eton. So people genuinely want to become scholars and it's a respected um Uh, It's a respected status within the school rather than perhaps being perceived as, you know, being being the poor kids 
the sort of children that you are seeing in the admissions registers in the 15th and 16th centuries you probably sort of think of them as a bit of more of a middling sort so they are you know the younger sons of knights they're they're sons of clerics or court officials so they're not the elite they're not the aristocracy but neither are they truly paupers and i guess the other thing that's worth mentioning at this point is that there is provision in all three of these schools for pupils to attend who are not scholars so at winchester they're known somewhat ironically as commoners um, because they end up being the pupils who are of more elite status than the scholars. Um, and then at Eton Westminster, they have oppidans, of course, never miss the opportunity for a bit of um, Latin slang. So that's town boys uh, to you and I. OK, and that, that is very interesting as well about people paying uh, paying for tutors and an element of kind of corruption that comes in there. And I think that's something that, that just goes throughout the history of education, there's been a big scandal in America in the in the last couple of years, actually, with lots of wealthy parents trying to exploit lots of loopholes to get their students into get their children into Ivy League colleges. And so I think this idea of education institutions as being something that impart a kind of prestige that almost uh, almost like a, a luxury good. That's something that's very much the case today. But I think you can see that it has its origins, um, perhaps in these schools. And, and that's one of the ways that that. The, the 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 students who are attending them shift the, 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 those types of students so that is is really interesting so essentially what you're, i think you're saying is by the time we get to the 19th century these are perhaps quite different schools with quite a different makeup than they were when they were originally founded definitely so i think as, as you're moving into the 17th and 18th centuries the schools become increasingly popular with gentry and aristocratic families and although there's still scope for pupils from less affluent backgrounds to to attend as scholars it's less attractive for them. And I think that's something that's really important to, to emphasise. So these schools, they become sought after by a particular class of people and less desirable um, for the lower orders of society. And that's because right through to the 19th century, these schools have as their curriculum Latin, Greek, perhaps a smattering of Hebrew, but there's no formal provision for mathematics and certainly no coverage of humanities modern foreign languages sciences it's an education which is suited to a gentleman or perhaps somebody who's going to join the church of england but not to many other professions and is that is is that and are there other things about these schools then are people are people criticizing them over this so by the time we get into the 19th century are people saying, hang on a minute, what's going on here? Why are they only learning Greek and Latin and Hebrew? Shouldn't we be doing some maths? It's funny, again, looking at the contemporary uh, residents here, you've just recently had Rishi Sunak say maths should be compulsory to 18. People have got a bit angry about that. But what you're saying is, in the 19th century, are people having these debates about the curriculum and what should be on the curriculum in these schools and what they should be studying? Are they having arguments about maths? (laughs) Yeah, very much so. In the late 18th century, Leeds Grammar School actually tried to change their curriculum to include more practical subjects. So they want to employ an extra couple of schoolmasters, one who's going to teach writing and bookkeeping, another one who's going to teach um, modern foreign languages. But there's actually a legal ruling made stating that their foundation statutes do not permit commercially useful instruction. That is unbelievable. You're <laughs> kidding me. So when people are talking today about, I've, I've seen quite a few people saying we shouldn't be teaching maths because school shouldn't be utilitarian and, you know, we should actually, we shouldn't be making it all about money. You're, you're saying to me that, that back in the 19th century, actually, they were saying you, you cannot teach anything that is commercially useful. Yeah. Right, okay. And yeah. then there's, the, there's yeah. the flip side. So there's schools that are in this big seven. So the Harrow, Rugby, Shrewsbury, that are getting more and more successful um, in the 18th century. They've been completely dominated by aristocratic pupils. And local families who had previously been able to use that facility start to feel that they're being squeezed out. And in 1810, the governors of Harrow School are actually brought, brought before the Rolls Court. And the local people say, you know, the children in Harrow Parish itself can't be sent safely or properly to the school on account of the number of foreigners. And when when they say foreigners, of course, they just mean people from outside of Harrow, um, (laughs) who are chiefly the sons of the nobility and the gentry of the kingdom and who constantly scoff and ill treat the other boys. 
But the governors, the governors defend the school and they successfully manage to argue that the school is a school for classical learning and that however wise the intentions of the founder might have been, the school is now not adapted to provide for persons of low condition, but is better suited to those of the higher class. These schools very much get colonised by this group of society. So in, in 1810, people in Harrow, if you live outside Harrow, you're a foreigner. Yeah. And, and that is interesting too, because I think you have seen in, in the, the past few decades, people complaining about perhaps some, some public schools, some independent schools, taking in lots of students from abroad. And this time when I'm saying abroad, I mean actually abroad. <laughs> so again, in, in 1810, they're complaining about students from outside Harrow going to Harrow. And nowadays, perhaps people are complaining about people outside the UK, that the numbers of those going to Harrow, that's, that's too high. And that's something I think we'll, we'll come back to a bit at the end about some of those, those debates in the last sort of um, 10 or 20 years or so. I suppose one of the things that people, again, praise and criticise these schools for is the development of the old boys network. So, so the idea that all of these boys from across England meet uh, in their teens at these schools and they form friendships and a network that will last forever and that potentially gives them advantages but potentially then also disadvantages those those people who haven't been to these schools so so tell us more about that old boys network what what is that how does that work it's interesting that one of the people who really begins to attack public schools in the early 19th century is uh this individual called lord broom and he's a scot so he's coming from outside and he's not part of this old boys network so he's one of the people who really lobbies to have um schools like eton and winchester investigated because they're charities and charities which he feels have strayed from their foundation statutes and so um, you know, if you've read your Trollope, something like The Warden, you'll know that in the 19th century there is this big push to revisit medieval and Tudor charities. But many of the schools actually managed to evade um, the reach of Lord Broom. Um, and although there is appetite for providing an education for the poor, very few want to dismantle the public schools in order to do so. And so eventually we do have this Clarendon Commission, but it's actually it's stacked with alumni of the schools that, um, that they're investigating. And so, yes, you do very much have the old boys network coming into play to protect these institutions. So Lord Broom is trying to dismantle the old boys network, but he's foiled by the old boys network. Mm -hmm. They all end up on the on on this Clarendon Commission and and kind of get it to say what they want it to say. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Brilliant. And I've got a test for you, Daisy. Go on. (laughs) The old boys network involves a sort of secret language. So I want to see if you can tell me which school these old boys would have gone to. Okay. Go so, go for it. Hit me. Yeah. Carthusians. I, I know this one. That's Charter House. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because, yeah. of course, it was once um, a Carthusian monastery. So, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the thing I always know about Charter House is it's originally, like St. Paul's, a, London, a, cent- a central London school that moves out. And obviously, I, I am a proud Londoner. And I, I always feel a bit miffed, you know, that you would leave the city. <laughs> but I guess they, they wanted more space. So there's still a Charterhouse Street in London. And I, I, I certainly, you know, you know, I used to uh, work working in there when I was, when I was younger. So I, I, know, I know where that is. But, but Charterhouse now, the school is out in, uh, in the home county somewhere. Is that right? Or... Yes, it is. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, if you've been paying attention, this will be an easy one. Yeah. Wickhamist. So that's Winchester because mm. it's founded by William Wickham. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and he's yeah. a he's a bishop. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they, that, that makes sense. Go for it. And um, what about Salopians? So this is a uh, Shrewsbury because that's a Latin for for Shrewsbury. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There okay. we go. Okay. All right. So there we go. There we three go. Three out of three. Okay. So... I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. You threw that on me, Elizabeth. So um, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll take that. Okay. So we've looked at we've looked at the origins of these schools. We looked at the criticism they get in the 19th century. We've looked at that, that, those bits about old corruption. As you say, Trollope writes about this a lot. And what I always find fascinating about Trollope is Trollope makes a, makes a defence of old corruption, which I always <laughs> think is pretty bold of him because some of the old corruption is, is quite brazen. Um, but, but he does make a defence of it, um, which is um, you know quite impressive of him. And what you're saying is a, a lot of these schools are maybe getting criticised a part of that, but they manage to survive it maybe maybe reinvent themselves in some ways but 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 survive it and 
and carry on. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Um, so let's bring it up today in the 20th, 21st century. I think as we've, we've seen, a lot of the debates we have today are actually there in the 18th and 19th century. So some of the things we're talking about now are, are not that new. Um, so actually, let's have a, one more sort of 19th century thing, the 20th century thing. So... A famous line about Eton is from the Duke of Wellington. Uh, the, 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 the line that Wellington is supposed to have said about uh, Eton is that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. Now, I'm not sure he did actually say it in exactly those terms, but certainly there seems to have been something he said in later life, looking at Eton, looking at the playing fields, looking at all the, the boys there playing sport, that something about, you know, this is where the sort of greatness of England is forged. And then Orwell in 1941, George Orwell, another old Etonian, he said, well, perhaps the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton, but the opening battles of all subsequent wars have been lost there. So what I find interesting about this is Wellington saying Eton is great, it's the stuff England's made of, Orwell saying hmm, not so much. But what they're both almost agreeing on tacitly is the idea that Eton, the people who go to Eton, that their centrality that they have within the British state and Wellington thinks that's a good thing, Orwell thinks it's not such a good thing, but they're, they're both kind of agreeing on that. So if we kind of bring this up to date in the 21st century, is that still the case now? We've had two Prime Ministers from Eton in recent years, with the current one from Winchester. Is it still the case that these public schools are still defining so much about Britain, whether that is for good or bad? Or, or is that waning? So what, what's your thoughts on that? It's interesting. I think you have really the height of the public school system in you know the years leading up to the first world war and they're seen as shaping you know a whole generation of people who go out um and you know essentially for the glory of the empire um establish britain's place in the world but following the first world war you know there's a lot more introspection and you do start um in the interwar period to get some of these um strands of criticism coming through and there's sort of two main strands of criticism of, of the public schools. One is that the schools are amazing, <clears throat> but they're exclusive. And we need everybody to be able to benefit from that kind of education. But the other strand is that, no, these schools are terrible and they're the source of all the, all the nation's problems. Um, and uh, there's a work by uh, a literary critic called Cyril Connolly, uh, published in 1938, which is called Enemies of Promise. And he's really quite scathing about his time at Eton. He says that it's his theory that the experiences undergone by boys at the great public schools, their glories and their disappointments are so intense as to dominate their lives and to arrest their development. And I think there's also, I've mentioned Orwell once already, obviously Orwell went to Eton. I think in one of his novels, one of his pre-war novels, I think it's... um, either coming up for air or keep the Aspidistra flying he says something similar he has a character in that who doesn't go to a public school say I'm really grateful I didn't because the kind of people who go to public schools it just obsesses them for the rest of their life and it's all they think about and they can never get over it (laughs) so I definitely see what you're saying there and interesting that some of the criticism comes from people who've been been to these schools and I think you're also right to say I think we see today as well that those slightly contradictory criticisms of public schools still exist the one that says they're 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 brilliant but they're they're too exclusive and the one that says actually they're incredibly damaging you'll often hear people almost make both those arguments in the in the same breath sometimes so but let's just go back to this issue of relevance of how central these schools are to the british state so i recently i've just recently got a really interesting collection of essays that's edited by two current senior leaders of independent schools Uh, David James and Jane Lunnan. It's called The State of Independence and it's exploring the challenges faced by independent schools today. And uh, one very interesting, very interesting essay in it is by Sam Friedman. He he writes a lot about British public policy in general. And his argument in this essay is that current independent schools, they've priced themselves into irrelevance. I think that's an exact quote from him. And, And he says that when he was a child, his parents were senior academics they sent him and his siblings to independent schools. 
Whereas nowadays, a typical senior academic would not be able to afford to send two children to a typical independent school. And so the point, the further point he makes from that is that this kind of narrowing of the sector of society who can afford to send their children to these schools, that has reduced these schools' influence over the British elite. And one thing he doesn't say, but that you hear hear said in debates about this, is there's a there's a famous, possibly apocryphal story about the Attlee government, the Attlee government of 1945. So the Attlee government obviously nationalised a lot of industries, and there was a, a rumour or some discussion that they would nationalise the public schools, the independent schools as well. And the story goes that the reason they didn't nationalise these schools is because half of the cabinet were sending their children to one of them. Now, I have no idea how true that is, but I think it kind of fits with this 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 point that um, that Sam Friedman is making. And it certainly is true that a cabinet minister today, with no other means than their salary, would struggle to pay the fees for two children to, to go to an independent school. And, and again, I, th- I think that's the point, the point Sam Friedman is making, that as independent school fees have outstripped inflation, that's reduced the number of alumni of these schools in top jobs and potentially therefore will reduce the influence they have. And well, let's go back to your story about Lord Broom. So Lord Broom was this outsider to these schools in the 19th century, wanted to reform them. And what you were telling telling us is that he was stymied by the fact that all the people who were on the reform committee were basically part of the old boys network. (laughs) So any attempt to reform these schools just came up against the barrier that the people doing the reforming had been to them and were part of them. And I suppose the Sam Friedman point is that future reform committees may not be able to rely on that old boys or indeed old girls network so much. So as I say, that is the the kind of the Sam Friedman argument. How far do you think that is true? I definitely think, I mean, it's undeniable that the fees have outstripped inflation, have outstripped the increases in people's earnings. There's always a danger that in these kind of conversations, we are very much focused on the scores at the, at the very top. You know, we're looking at the Eatons of this world rather than the 300 schools that are members of HNC. So that's the only thing I would caution against, the, the, the repeated um, fixation on Eton at the exclusion of the real breadth that you find in the sector. But as to whether Friedman's claims... <laughs> Uh, come to pass well time will tell yeah yeah definitely definitely so time will tell and I think what you've shown us in this episode is these debates are not going away but that in actual fact the debates we're currently having about these schools they are just extensions of debates that people have been having for quite literally hundreds of years and I think one of the most striking things that I take away from this episode is that that term independent schools is in many ways quite misleading because from, I think, as you've shown from their origin, these schools are intertwined with, with the state. The schools are set up by kings and bishops. Some of them are established with royal statutes. They're established explicitly to create servants of the British state or the English state as it, as it is. And the other thing I find fascinating is that, that this Public Schools Act is passed in 1868. And that is before, that's earlier than... <laughs> The, the the first legislation to create actual state schools, which is not until a couple of years later, kind of 1870, 1871. So what we are now calling independent schools, in many ways, they have a longer history of involvement with the British state than actual state schools. Um, so I, I think this debate is going to run and run. It's 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 in the news at the minute. It will continue to be in the news. So, so thank you for giving us a, a little bit of historical perspective about it. So that's it for this episode. We're going to be back with something a bit different for our next episode. And next time round, we're going to look at the experiences of working class people who couldn't afford any kind of formal school education and so taught themselves instead. I hope you'll join us for that. And thank you for listening today. So goodbye from us. Goodbye. <laughs>